everyone, my name is Zach McLean. In this installment, we are taking a look at the bad boys behind me. The EPS 16 from Ensonic and the Emulator 4 from EMU. So we are joined by Sam Willis, as usual. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Very well. Uh, so these samplers, I mean, they're a little bit more than samplers, I guess. Uh, if you want to maybe introduce the Emulator 4 uh, Ultra. Yeah, so and this what is, it does best. This is the Emulator 4 uh, E4XT from EMU, which is the sort of final realization of the emulator series. So there was emulator 1, 2, 3, and 4, uh, which are the sort of big brothers of the SP1200, the SP12, the sort of sampling drum machines. So these are the sort of full workstations which have every form of instrument in them. They're used by film composers, um, rock stars like Paul McCartney, Peter Gabriel, all kinds of um, people within the industry were using emulators of various different kinds because they were the gold standard apart from the likes of the Fairlight which are 30, 40,000 pounds and completely unaffordable for all but the most uh, yeah. obsessed. Kate Bush used one for instance. So em EMU were able to really create a huge amount of uh, options and, and variety within one box and the E4XT is the final realisation of that. And so within here, we have some amazing filters, effects, uh, multiple um, MIDI input sort of stages. So you can send, you can have a whole session running with triggered up to 32 channels. So each one of those uh, presets can have a whole drum kit, or it could be a multi sampled instrument like a pad or a piano. So not only did it ship with a fantastic library of legacy samples, much like Native Instruments Complete, where you have a whole uh, range of, of uh, sound effects like rain, wind, yeah. uh, bass guitar, um, a whole suite of analog synth um, multi-samples, whether it be the ARP 2600 or Prophet 5, you can pretty much find a patch in there that will fit your taste. Yeah. But, but where it really came into its own was in the hands of people like drum and bass sort of maestros like Ed Rush and Optical, Dillinger, who really took the unit and uh, used and abused it beyond what it was supposed to do, whether it be using the internal uh, gain structure to completely distort an 808 and turn that into a bass line, morphing it with the, the various features, uh, like the filters and the effects, to create richly evolving kind of bass sounds and tones, along with the sort of crystal clear analog to digital conversion, which means that you can have super punchy uh, sounds of re-triggering from it. Yeah, and why would you, I mean, it's kind of a DAW in a box in a way, this thing. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Before, computers were powerful enough to run like a whole uh, session with plugins and uh, emulations of all this stuff. This was the only option. So they were really still quite expensive at, at the time. The most expensive version going for around £4,000 in right. sort of late 90s, early 2000s. So now that we have DAWs, yes. why would you go back to this? Um, I think, for me, the price that they're available for now, which is say three to four hundred pounds, the ability to again get lost in a uh, a different kind of workflow where you're able to have everything in one place and sort of turn knobs and push buttons, you are able to to really commit to the the creative process rather than having um, too many options. You can really hone down what you want within the session, and you're also able to run it live off of MIDI. So what we're going to do today is send some MIDI note data from Ableton into the unit because um, it does have a sequencer but it's very rudimentary so I would yeah. recommend if anyone wants to try it out they should uh, use an external sequencer. Back in the day it would have been Cubase uh, or maybe an Atari ST sort of sending the MIDI note data um, and from that you're able to potentially even save some time like change the sounds and reuse that same MIDI. If you've got kicks, you can change a kick out. Whereas a lot now, because of even though the processing power is as strong as it is, a lot of people now commit to audio. So if you're working on a full track, you'll end up, to save resources, you'll end up with a lot of audio, which ultimately you can't really reuse too easily. Whereas with this, yeah. if you can change the tempo at any point during the track, you can really um, it, it's a it's an interesting way to try to work in in the modern the modern day. Yeah. Shall we hear it then? Yeah. Get so some sound going. So 
what we have here is a, just a quick loop I've knocked together, so let's have a listen. So at this point you're hearing it just coming straight out of the um, out of the emulator. There's no sort of bus compression or anything else to sort of really fatten it up. But we can um, we can hear like a number of different presets, some, some drums, um, we've got a bit of a pad sound going on there, a bass, which have resampled uh, and process using the effects to kind of give it more of a kind of texture and movement. Yeah. If I just stop and kind of play that for you, you can really hear the crunch and the sort of the sizzle of the, yeah. of the processing, which is uh, one of the other main things of the emulator is that you can resample internally. So you're able to sort of stretch and uh, process the audio and then resample it within rather than having to. Um, use a sort of plug-in chain, you end up kind of committing to the sound and layering effects on top of effects using the various parameters. It has a very complicated uh, structure in terms of the, the, the ter terminology they use is chords. So it's very much like a modular synth that you can send LFOs or triggers to modulate different parameters, whether it's filter cutoff or frequency uh, pan. Uh, Doppler effects to shift sounds around within space. So you can really kind of get lost and get creative with creating these sort of one shot kind of bizarre sort of sounds. And there's an, there's an austerity in the way that you work, which if you go back and listen to some of those older sort of drum and bass records, you can hear there's a lot of negative space where because you don't have complete ability to do anything, everything, you're able to kind of write music which is a little bit more refined and um, uncluttered, I think. You don't fill all the spaces up with, with as yeah. much as you can when you're able to just throw things in on the screen. Yeah. And there's effects built in as well, right? Yeah, so it's got some great effects. The effects are set up on a sort of master level where you're able to do some rudimentary sort of separating out, but what makes most sense is sort of committing to the sound and using the effects on an individual basis and then resampling it because if you, if you want to use some, say like a master reverb, then that's going to hold you back in terms of what you can do creatively. But yeah. if we were to take this bass sound, we could now go to the effects and in the moment it's bypassed, so I'm going to enable it and you can hear straight away obviously a lot more kind of uh, depth and, and space. So this is a warm hall preset, but we've got all kinds of bright plate, concert nine, gate. So those are all just reverbs. Yeah, these are all yeah. just reverbs on Master Effect A. Master Effect B is a lot of chorus flanging. Uh, you've got various delays. So. Let's say we like that, what we can then do is resample that internally. So if we go to create a new sample, uh, we then select up here the internal resampling, which you can do in a number of different bit choices. So we'll give it yeah. a 16 bit to kind of keep it grungy. We can see it's sort of clipping internally there, but it can. Now that didn't quite work. Let's try that again. Okay, so now we can map it out on the key on the keyboard. One of the things that's great about the emulator is that it gives you the op option to um, choose how you want your samples to be laid out in a very sort of intuitive way. So in this case, is assuming we want to go for a polyphonic. Uh, arrangement, but if we were just going for one shots like a drum sampling yeah. in an 808, then we can change that to a per key basis where it will then lay it out in that, in that particular way. So if we just choose, you can see here it says it's clipped, but obviously we like how it sounds. So if we create a new preset, let's go for preset 14. And then it will naturally it'll move it onto the preset, so we'll just leave it as untitled for now. It's truncating and looping, so that it will automatically bring it up to level and loop it for us. 
So if we now go back to, uh, let's say preset 11. So this is, these are the 16 MIDI channels that we can now choose which preset we want to apply. So if we change our MIDI channel, and now go back and change the effects because they're still on the master stage. So we have to go back and bring this back round. So you're basically printing the effect. Printing somewhere. the effect, exactly, yeah. yeah. So put it back to a room effect. And or you could just do it again. Ex yeah, exactly. Double up on yeah, the effect. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Again, it's all based on your own individual um, preference. So. We're now sending to channel 11. So you can now hear that we've obviously distorted it even further. We've added the reverb. Yeah. And you can really have a lot of fun just messing around and getting really creative, then going in, filtering it again, changing up the settings so that you're warping it even further. And I think that's one of the one of the things that really stood out with that sort of tech step style of drum and bass that where it ultimately evolved with the updating of the, the operating system on the, the emulator 4 it meant that there was more and more kind of textures and colors to play with in terms of the number of filter types the number of effects and particularly with the modular chord aspect you can really create some very sort of strange and evolving sounds and textures with it or you can just simply use it as a sort of great sounding um, uh, sort of playback device because the build quality on these machines is really exemplary and no corners were cut because they were built by a small company who really um, were obsessed with quality and, and, and had a very unique uh, approach about how they did everything. So all this being said, there is a certain commitment to learning how to use the yeah. architecture of the machine. So it's, a lot of people do get frustrated um, in the initial instance because it's so much easier just to lapse back to your sort of door, you know, so it's not for everybody, but I think for those people who, particularly who are interested in the sound of that sort of 90s drum and bass, um, and who like working with sound design and, and, and creating uh, different kinds of textures, this is really um, for the price. I mean, you can go, go further down the scale. This is one of the final iterations. You can get cheaper versions of the emulator for um, for much less, maybe like 80 to 100 pounds, if you wanted to dip your toe in and, and see what what the sound is like and yeah. if it can work fit with your workflow. So the Ensonic EPS 16 Plus Digital Sampling Workstation, to give it its full title. I mean, this is like almost 10 years older, right? This yes. One, yeah. yeah, so you can sort of see straight away just by looking at it cosmetically, you have the different sort yeah. of style of, of display, which I personally love. It's like an old calculator. Yeah. And I think that's something that, um, for me, what I love about these machines is, is just the, the character that they have and, and the sort of the age that they speak of in that late night sessions looking into, you know, these kind of cool Little letterbox. displays. It, it's just, it, it feels a bit more kind of romantic somehow than just looking at like an Ableton um, screen only, you know. Yeah. And who's, who was, um, was using these uh, bits of kit at the time and later on? Well, because of, as we mentioned, the fact that these were the only game in town. There wasn't really an, too much of an option for people to, to to use a computer at that stage. They were used by hip hop artists, um, electronic artists, and Sonic were a slightly more affordable brand than Emu, and as such, they got used a lot by people like RZA from Wu Tang Clan, um, Havoc, Mob Deep's producer, LP from. Company Flow and now run the Jewels still uses one today yeah. um, alongside its bigger brother, the ASR10, which is the, sort of s the next iteration, which is used by Kanye West, Timberland. Um, ordinarily, these were more known as a sort of keyboard workstation where you would have the keyboard um, to lay out your sort of groups of samples and things. And you can really hear that if you listen to, say, Raekwon uh, and Ghostface. Um, 
only but built for Cuban Links album, for instance, I think is a real masterclass in um, repitching of samples and creating these very strange atonal uh, melodies and harmonies of the sort of clash of soul and funk loops with weird yeah. martial arts uh, sort of soundtrack noises. And so with this, I think it has a slightly war noticeably warmer sound than the the emulator, but it's also much more rudimentary in terms of its feature set. So you have eight individual instruments which can again be um, multi-sampled um, instruments like we have here. A, if we just play something, this is... Um, uh, turn this on. A jazz bass. If we add some effects to that. Also, one thing that's interesting is that it actually goes up to 78 kilohertz with seven voices, which is more than uh, you would imagine for a 1990 era piece of kit. Yeah. But um, some weird specialist effects there. Um, but there's a real. Um, richness to the the sound of the delays the and sonic also made the dp4 which is quite a famous multi-effect yeah. which this is from the same uh, stable it's not quite as advanced and you don't have as much control or as many different presets but it really has a sort of a richness to the sort of delays and the reverb that it's kind of counterintuitive because you would imagine that the likes of effects would have um, only improved with age and time but the reality is is that something to do with the, the the electronic processes behind the algorithms that were written at these times um, really still have a place today companies like lexicon as well who are also very famous for having these imperfect rich sounds which we know from countless classic records of all stripes yeah. dance electronic music um, rock music, and so I think with this, they're, st they're still very much uh, relevant, and it means that as part of your sort of whole studio setup, having a machine like this as part of it is um, again like a refreshing break to step out of the door, the normal door environment, and to program um, using MIDI your sounds within it. So, I mean, we've got here also like an 808 which which sounds pretty fantastic when you consider it's it's, it's just a, a sample from the 1990s no multi sample no round robin it's just coming straight off of the off of the machine yeah. with a little bit of effect on it and they really um, there is a richness to the sort of bottom end particularly which i think can get a little bit lost in if you just put it into a, a drum rack in Ableton. They're very subtle differences, you know, they're not essential, but I think I'd encourage anybody who has the opportunity to sort of try it out and, and, and just maybe feel the differences because whilst they're not essential, I think electronic music is a music made up in small degrees where we're always looking for a bit of an edge, a bit of a different sort of texture, yeah. and using sounds from these different machines will really help um, give dynamic and definition to your sound by virtue of, of different sources, different um, converters, different sample rates, which is something that we could um, try on here, is sampling something in. Yeah, yeah, let's give it a go. I mean, how much does this, I was gonna say retail, how much can you get this on eBay for, or Gumtree, or? This is actually a bit of a sleeper unit, in my opinion, given how powerful it is. Yeah. Um, they can go from anywhere as low as 150 all the way up to maybe 250. Um, I've never actually owned the keyboard unit because I happened to come across this first, and this is sort of, the rack version of the EPS-16 is fully loaded with the maximum memory with the eight outputs, because the, the keyboard one just comes with two, you need to buy a separate unit to right. get that. So um, it's still very, very affordable. It's slightly less kind of sought after than the, the Emulator 4 series, just because they're so famously associated with sort of this drum and bass sound. But if we uh, sample to a new instrument here, so if we, the process is we all go to command sample, 
got the zip drive here. Oh yeah, we should mention the zip. Yeah, so some of you out there may have not seen one of these before. This is um, the sort of technology which existed before uh, hard disk became uh, more affordable and more realistic for companies. The, the sh we should mention the emulator has um, 128 gigabyte internal hard drive, right. which is only available via the last operating system upgrade. So, um, so that is completely chock full of samples. Whereas with this, um, I laboriously loaded all the original floppies I got with it onto the uh, the zip drive, so you can access uh, them in sort of folder, sort of hierarchies of different sounds. So, um, so it refers back to the zip drive just to sort of reload the operating system for what it needs. And then if we pick the sample instrument, so we're going to sample to instrument track five. It'll create a new wave sample. Won't go too much into the terminologies now, but you have different layers. So if you wanted to have a choke group for your hi-hats, you can put yeah. those on a separate one to your kicks and snares. So yes, and then if we cycle to the right, we can see you've got a variety of different sample rates. So 44.6 more than CD quality, all the way down to 11.2, which is yeah, just just over a quarter of the fidelity. Um, one of the reasons you might want to do that is if you were looking to sort of approximate more of an SP1200 sound, you can get a much sort of crunchier sound to it. And if we scroll to the right, there's another se section where it has an automatic uh, filter cutoff, which is there to remove the the aliasing and the kind of noise that accumulates when from you sample, the low sample rate. Yeah, from the low sample rate. But you can actually choose, if you wanted to have it as an effect, then you can actually choose to take the filter out. You can go all the way up to out, and that now, which I, I think, as we talked about in this series, I think the imperfections and the, um, the sort of textures that you get from lower fidelity sampling is now something that we're actually looking for. Whereas in those, in the days that the, the machines were made, they were very much trying to clean everything up, yeah. and, and as a result, we're now in a position where we can pick and choose the fidelity that we want as we go along. So it's a line level input. We've, as you can see here, at this low level, we've got 64 seconds worth of sampling. So there's actually quite a significant. It's pretty good, yeah, for the, for the early 90s. Yeah. Absolutely. And so if we choose just a simple synth patch, uh, so we arm it, and then data is now being processed. So if we send a trigger to. So what we can do now is it's actually quite also quite quick to sample. In this case, we're going to um, play the root key, which I'll do as C1, and then um, it's automatically going straight through to the effects. So we can now turn it up, and if we go to the filter, we can change. It also has like really nice uh, filters. They're not analog filters, but they do a really good job of sort of shaping the sound in a sort of non-destructive way. In the way sometimes filters in the computer can sometimes feel a little bit kind of cold, whereas with this, it does have a nice warmth to it. And um, we can also resample in this. I'm not going to do that now because it's a little bit time consuming. Yeah. But you're able to apply the effects and sample it, and then re re-import it back in again without actually leaving the 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 unit itself. So you can, if we bring the filters back out, we can hopefully hear some of the yeah, the sort of track of the sound. So it's <laughs> that that kind of crispiness is from the resampling as it pitches down. I think you know it sounds cool. Like we're in a position now to rather than hear that as a mistake, you can actually choose to use that within your production. Yeah, absolutely. As opposed to needing to put a Ableton Redux on and then yeah. filter it out and it, it just do, it won't sound quite the same. It can get very close and a lot of it depends on your own uh, personal preference, your ears, whether you feel that it's worth uh, the time and the, the effort to do something like that. But for me it just puts a smile on my face when you, you kind of put something in and you're less sure of what you're going to get back out again. And so, uh, so that's why I use this this unit. Let's try a few different sounds on here. We've got some really nice. It comes with some really nice uh, pad sounds. Which 
which again we can sort of play around with the effects. And yeah, so I think that it just gives a general sort of sense of um, what the units are kind of capable of. Yeah, for sure. So you mentioned there's a keyboard version of this. Do you know how much that would go for? That's more towards sort of 250. That's slightly more okay. desirable because you've got the whole unit. Yeah, yeah. and it's all in one. All in one, yeah. And I think, um, but again, it's more of a personal preference because th there's been a history of producers like RZA and like the Mob Deep guys, LP, uh, Timberland, Kanye, the Neptunes, who have gravitated towards keyboard-based workstations, the Korg Triton being another famous example where you're able to just play in a more musical fashion as opposed to the likes of the MPC and the SP-1200, which are more pad-based, sort of rhythmic. So I think um, a lot of it depends on the individual. If someone was coming from a sort of classical piano background, they probably would feel a lot more comfortable with the, the keyboard version. So I think yeah. we're very much orientated now around doors, you know, laptops and controller sort of pads, and obviously the the USB keyboard, but not so much. I think the idea of the the keyboard workstation is slightly less sort of uh, widely known, maybe than yeah. perhaps it could be. And I think it could be a really great fit for um, for certain musicians who have that background because they can really get hands on then and just. Uh, you can split the sounds up over the keyboard, so you can have multi instruments where you're really able to maybe play your drums and playing over the top with your sort of top lines and pads and bass and things. Yeah, nice one. So there you go, that's the top of the line. Emulator 4, which goes from anything from about 100 to this one, which is about 300, 400 quid. Uh, and the, of course, the Ansonic EPS 16 Plus, which you can pick up for about 150 or about 250 for the keyboard. So go check them out. <laughs>